You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Attention Matters with your host, Alice Aspen March. Alice is here to discuss why the kind of attention we get and give to others is vital and impacts our behavior and our feelings. People can remember forever the kind of attention they got from teachers, parents and grandparents, dentists, from everyone in their lives, especially when it feels good and or feels bad. Alice is here to give you tools to intervene in your attention factor. So please welcome the host of Attention Matters, Alice Aspen March. And we're alive, and it's another Tuesday, and this is why our attention matters. And this is your host, Alice Aspen March, with a marvelous guest today, Professor Rita Jacobs, Dr. Rita Jacobs, who has been on my show before, and I just loved the conversation we had. Rita was a professor of English at Montclair State University a widely published journal writer. Her books include, well, I, I, there are so many, it's wonderful, but I'm going to re- mention your last book, which I'm more than interested in, The Way In, Journal Writing for Self-Discovery, that was published in 2009. Welcome, Rita. Hi, Alice. It's wonderful to be here with you, especially at the beginning of a new year. That's the truth, isn't it? And you know, I was reading. I, I love I love all the books you've written. You've written a lot of uh, coffee table books, really. A day in the life yes, of America, which I, which I've had, which I had years ago. The day in the life of Canada. A day in the life of Japan and Tommy, the musical. Well, Tommy's Tommy's the book that always gets a lot of attention because I worked with. Pete Townsend, who founded The Who, uh, for eight months on that book. So I was in rock and roll heaven. (laughs) Rock and roll heaven. And now you're going for the inside of us. That's, I like that. That's quite a transition from rock and roll heaven to writing for self-discovery. Oh, my. But you had a good time, didn't you? Oh, I had a great time. And working with the cast of the Broadway show was amazing. But you know what? Keeping a journal during all that time was important also. I mean, figuring out how to work with people who are immensely creative and some of whom have large egos. And we all know that large egos are pretty fragile. So figuring out how to approach people and get the best from them was helped by my own journal writing. You know, you just made a very juicy statement. We all know that people with large egos are very fragile. Can I ask you to expand on that, please? Well, it takes a lot of upkeep to maintain a large (laughs) ego. And, uh, you know, some people are pretty well defended and they don't take criticism to heart. But usually, if you have a large ego and are um, an actor, a writer, uh, somebody puts themselves out there, then you take criticism seriously. I mean, partially because criticism helps you grow, but also you have to be able to understand whether the criticism is constructive or not. When and how would you... Uh, surmise that these big egos come from? Where do they come from? Oh, uh, too varied. I mean, sometimes it comes from praise when you're young, 
Sometimes it comes from a defense about not being praised and having to praise yourself. I, I wonder if you can, if it can balance out the praise so that it just doesn't develop, I mean, balance it so that, so that they don't develop a bad, big ego and can't take any criticism. All they need is praise. Well, listen, I'm not a psychologist. I'm an English professor. So um, although I do read a lot of novels and talk about them, and one of the things that one does when one reads novels is try to understand the psychology of the character, uh, I, I think that praise, you know, it's, it's a problem these days very often with, um, it's mentioned in the press a lot, where everybody gets a prize. Right? Every, every kid gets a prize. Yeah. And nobody ever loses. Well, one of the most important things you can learn is how to lose. Absolutely. How to fail. And that's, if I can go back to journals, I mean, when you fail, you sometimes take to understanding what failure means by writing about it. Which is such a gift to yourself because you can really learn from that. And you're all by yourself. Oh, you're talking. You're really talking to yourself. You know, yeah, uh, from my to yourself. yeah, from my standpoint of spending so many years on the kind of attention we need, because attention is a core issue for everybody, human core issue. And if you don't get what you need, you don't thrive. So I'm thinking that parents. Who, who really compliment their children too much, overly, maybe because they didn't get any in their childhoods, are really causing uh, some trouble for these kids. And that's where this big ego comes from. They're not, this is a huge subject, and I'm happy we're just talking about it a little, um, because everybody needs to listen to criticism if, they're, if they've got enough internal stability to wonder why that criticism is coming and where it's coming from and just listen to it one of the things that we've stopped doing is listening and I'm terribly oh, yeah. concerned Yeah, and uh, you don't even have to say anything just listen so that the person that you're listening to gets that you're really listening I mean you would say I'm really listening to you well, I've always wanted to ask you a question since I know you talk about attention. Is there such a thing as good attention versus bad attention? It's all the two kinds there are, Rita. Absolutely. You know, attention is an energy that we feel. We feel the good. It makes us feel good. Our bodies actually smile. They can't help it. And if we get bad attention, we don't feel good. We get anxious, we get riled up, we want to know what's wrong with us, and uh, it doesn't feel good. And we and that is an absolute sense. You could try it out sometime. Uh, I, I had somebody say to me recently, I don't know if my, hus if my husband listens to me. And I said, ask him, are you listening to me? And see what happens. We have got to learn to really speak from our needs. Like, I don't think you, you know, I feel very bad when you don't include me in a conversation. See, that's a major right. issue. It's hard. That's hard to do. That's well, hard that's, to do. It's hard to speak up for yourself. And the best thing we can do is teach children how to do that. Right on. It's vital. I, I got to go back to when I first when I when I had an epiphany over the word attention because I was on a quest. I did the old, I didn't know anything about attention, really. Only what I saw on billboards, attention sale. I didn't know that it was a prime reason why my youngest son was acting out, because I didn't know he had any. Because I didn't know I had any needs for attention. It's it's a whole modern day subject. But it's been researched since the 1920s. You know, when when orphans don't get the the kind of attention they need in the orphanage, they become they disconnect. They disconnect from everything, and they ultimately die. It's because they aren't well, looked at. Well, 
Yeah. Can I segue a little to journals? Because in a way, a journal is a way of paying attention to yourself. And you can yes. get attention from yourself about yourself. You, th- that isn't a segue. That's a direct hit, Rita. Because, okay. you know, <laughs> we've all got to learn what we need to take care of ourselves. That's vital. Right. Yeah. So, you know, this is a jo- job of parents. But it's newly developed and it's newly talked about. Because I, my, I'll talk about myself because I'm a perfect experience. I just knew things that other people didn't know as I grew up. It bothered my mother a lot because she didn't want to know anything. She didn't want me to know anything she didn't know. So I got in trouble for knowing things. I got, you know, she once stood at the top of the stairs in our house and put her hands on her hips and said, you're such a selfish little girl. And so I thought that was the worst thing I could be. When you're selfish, you really learn to take care of yourself. That word has gotten a bad rap. It's not the same as self-centered. You're learning to take care of yourself. Yep. Yeah, they're usually used interchangeably. People are not very good with um, precise syntax. <laughs> You're right. You're right. But, but look at where we've gone with this one subject. I mean... Right, right. It, it's big. Well, actually, it's... A, I've been developing an, uh, a journal writing app for tween girls called Sheebler where they can write about how they feel in a kind of interactive way with an app so that they get listened to and all the the app is not, you know, a therapist, the app will say, can you say more about that? So that um, there's encouragement for writing and for going deeper. It's an incredibly important thing. And I love what you just shared with us. She apt so that they really have a friend. Go apt. Go well, apt. It's called, it's called She Blurt, B L U R T, where you're able to say anything you want. And then Just people have to have, re- have respect for these journals. They, ha- they demand respect because if, if we don't take good care of them and somebody really wants to hurt us and they get into our journal and tell people what we've written, that is a big personal blow what do you well, what do you privacy privacy is a major issue with journals and you have to protect what you write i mean first of all you have to be able to write from your heart from your head from your gut and not censor yourself second of all you need to know that that journal then becomes a very powerful thing so you have to protect it. I know people who have a lockbox and they lock their journals up. I have a friend who keeps her journal in the trunk of her car and she's the only one who drives that car. And I know other people who um, trust who they live with and they write on the journal, this is my journal and it's private. If you'd like to know what's in it, ask me. Now that's testing other people, but um, you know, it's a sign of respect in a relationship. It's a to sign of respect for yourself. Somebody. Well, but to trust somebody else with their respect for you. If well, you have a journal, you don't lock it up, it's on your desk, you know, in your own private pile of things, and sometimes people get betrayed. Yes, I know they do. people who've used journals in divorce cases. So it's really his wife's journal. Yeah. It, it's really a piece of self care then. Well, it can be, yes, and it should be. I'll tell you about but, the health respect health aspects when we get back because I think thank you, you have a break coming up. We do. We have a commercial break and we're into some very deep, wonderful conversation here and we'll be back very soon and we're still alive at 866-451-1451. Join us. Ask us questions. 
If you seek a courageous advocate, prepare to champion your rights with consumer service agencies that support aging populations. Carol Ann Hamilton is the one for you. Carol Ann is an elder care coach, author, and speaker with a quarter million hours lived experience successfully supporting unculpable aging parents. As a result of a challenging journey, Carol Ann revolutionizes how stressed out caregivers restore serenity to their worlds. She also brings over 25 years of change management expertise in Fortune 500 settings to catalyze urgent transformation within the elder care industry. Carol Ann is a popular speaker at conferences across North America. She has appeared via TV, radio, and print globally. Now you can tune in weekly to get a dose of her inspiration plus down-to-earth advice to cope with even the most difficult aging parents. Listen Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on Bold Brave Media and TuneIn Radio. Dr. R.C. will share extraordinary resources and services that promote educational success as well as making a difference in the lives of all social workers as well as the lives of children, adolescents, and teens of today. She will have open discussions addressing many of the issues that we face about our youth and how being employed in the uniquely skilled profession of social work for over 18 years has taught invaluable lessons through her personal experiences. She will also provide real-life facts, examples, and personal stories that will confirm that why serving as a child advocate is extremely beneficial when addressing the needs of the whole child. Listen live Saturdays, 10 a.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio as Dr. R.C. will provide thought-provoking information that will empower, encourage, and strengthen students, families, and communities across our nation. You can also visit her at soarwithkatie.com. Rita, I, I assume yeah. that you have lots of stories about privacy and journals. Yes, there are lots of stories. Um, I started to mention one. I was on a call-in show when this book first came out, and a woman called to say that her husband had found her journal, and people often vent in journals, and he had Xeroxed it, and underlined in yellow or yellow highlighted every time she said something awful about him and presented it to his lawyer to use his evidence in a divorce case. And that's, um, that's out of bounds. I mean, I don't know what the lawyers did or how it turned out, but it was kind of really below the belt. And then I know a, a young man whose stepmother went looking under his mattress, which is where he hid the journal, read the journal, and it was a newly blended family. He was unhappy. He was venting about his stepmother. And she then threw accusations at him about the things he said. Well, mind you, that was the end of their relationship in terms of any kind of openness. And he didn't write in his journal again till he left and was an adult. So those betrayals of trust, the idea that you need a place where you can vent, where you can exult, where you can ponder, any of the things that one does in a journal and not feel betrayed by somebody finding it is, a, is very, very important. It, it's vital. It's vital, vital to protect that kind of thing. And if people right. make and fun you have of to it, protect yourself. Absolutely. Oh my gosh! I love the fact that a woman put it in her trunk, because that was her space, and she had total control right. over it. Yeah. Yet, so uh, on the other hand, I do have a friend who left his journal, and he, I'm, he must have done this subconsciously. He left his journal on the bed. And his partner was making the bed, had to move the journal, opened it because it was too tempting and it was right there, read some of the conversation in it, some of the uh, confessions in it, some of the observations, and then brought that up. And they had an incredibly constructive conversation. So clearly my friend couldn't say what he needed to say to his partner and did it that way. And did it that way. Well, listen, it worked for them. And his partner, must have, he must have known that was the way to go. 
uh, you know, yeah. intuited that if he couldn't say it, he could write it, and the man could find it. I mean, you don't uh, you don't right. obviously leave your journal on. Yeah, you know. well, you have to. You know, you have, uh, there's a lot of intuition I would imagine that shows up in a journal because you don't have anybody there to trust uh, to judge you, so you can really be totally open and honest. Well, and if you are open and honest in your journal, there have been lots of studies done on how writing in a journal can improve your health. I mean, yeah. in all kinds of ways. James James Pennebaker out of the University of Texas did studies with college students, and if they wrote for 10 minutes in about their personal feelings before taking an exam, they not only did better on the exam, their blood pressure was lower. That is vital for all of us to know, because I don't think that's generally talked about on talk shows. Anything no, that I increases, don't think so. anything that increases healthy habits, I want to know about. Well, there was I mean, interesting. I just wrote an article about, which I shared with you, about um, keeping a gratitude journal, and. Ten years ago, a professor of psychology at University of California, Davis, Robert Emmons, did a study of people who expressed gratitude, often through journal writing, and he found physical, psychological, and social benefits that were measurable, including stronger immune system, lower blood pressure, better sleep, higher levels of positive emotion, more joy and pleasure, more optimism, and that the people became more outgoing and more forgiving and felt less lonely. Well, how, how vital is that to know right now, right now? Exactly, exactly. The, the feelings of isolation that we are all living through can, can be somewhat alleviated if you look for the things that you're grateful to rather than complaining about what we're all complaining about. So there are moments, there are moments in every day that kind of wake you up to the fact that you're here, you're alive, you are processing information, you're making food, even if you're so bored of cooking, as I am. All of those things have a positive effect on your immune system. Even, you know, even if you smile when you're writing, you wind up writing something more positive. I mean, that's a studied response that if you smile, your your blood pressure gets lower and you immediately feel better. So that's there are lots I... and lots of ways of lots of ways of addressing this period in our lives and writing about what you're going through is incredibly important, not only for the individual who's writing, but, you know, those journals who were, that were kept in 1918 are now very valuable for historians, for families to know what people were going through, and that's the same right now. You know, I have your list of... Um, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about number seven out of eight. Be ready to compliment yourself. That is so important. If you finish a project, you know, I, one of the things that I've been involved in heavily is archiving and getting rid of a lot of papers from the last 30 years. And I lose things. I put them in different piles, and then I don't know where they are. If I find something that I missed or that I put in another pile and I felt bad about it when I find it again I am so thrilled it's like I've accomplished right. my mind is working my memory is working everything's on go so that is oh I love this list I love this list uh, well that's a list and you can put the link up on your website after this show it's a link to a, a article on keeping a gratitude journal that I wrote for the Rancho La Puerta blog, and um, there are, you're right, eight suggestions as well as the health benefits. But I think the one you chose about being ready to compliment yourself and being grateful for your own initiative and strength 
and being grateful for being able to help or accept help from others and to ask for help from others yes. is incredibly important for making you a functioning um, and and uh, better situated human being these days. Right? Rita, you want to be comfortable in yourself. It's vital that we get away from this asking for help business because it's a weakness. Oh, not a weakness at all. No. Not a weakness at all. No, and you know you'll you'll find that it makes your relationship stronger. I mean, it depends what kind of help you're asking for. If you're always asking for money, that's not going to make a great relationship. But if you're asking for advice, if you're asking for help with learning something, if you're saying, I love the way you do this, can you tell me more about how I can learn to do that? Then, Perfect. you know, everybody loves being asked for help. Um, advice about their own expertise. You said that so well. Can, uh, Thank you. Yeah, really. Uh, I have learned to, I don't do it out loud, you know, like good one, Alice, but when I accomplish something that is that I've been stuck with or in and I figure out the solution, I am really very internally proud of myself. I could put that in a journal. I, well, I am. I am. You know, you know what's interesting? And if you write about being pleased with yourself, then you get that feeling more often. I find that a lot of people, especially young women, start to keep journals where they're always moaning about how they're not good enough and why doesn't he like me and why is my boss not complimenting me more. You know, there's a lot of that. But if you start writing about what you did well or how and the ways in which you feel successful, you will have those feelings more often. You need to acknowledge, make it concrete in some way, and one way is to write about it or tell somebody about it. But most people don't want to brag, so they're afraid to tell people too much about what they think is good about themselves. But if you write about it, then you take strength from knowing that and being able to activate it in yourself. And that just contributes, that strength continue, contributes to your immune system. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It contributes to a sense of, you know, it takes pressure off you when you can, when you can relax into the positives because you know they're there. We, I, you know, these days a lot of us have taken to more meditation I certainly have and in some of the meditations I've been doing um, I have been learning to let go of perfectionism great that's super and you right. know and it, you, can, it, you can go ahead I think that we all, uh, if we're not born with it we, we move into a family that is practicing judging and I think if you write this kind of thing into your journal, uh, I'm not going to judge myself anymore because I really know what I can do and what I can't. That's a feeling of freedom. It's a feeling of power also. Pa yes, it's very empowering. That would be a good thing yes. to think. This is my power journal. Uh, you know, it's. I'm so glad you're uh, here with me again because this is a really, really empowering uh, experience that you've arrived at and especially now we need to it's, it's a joyful experience as well because you've got a friend that you can who's not going to judge you and who you can tell anything to it's true actually I always I always say that writing in a journal shouldn't be um, a scheduled chore what it should be is something you want to turn to. Just like if you have a friend you don't talk to every day, but when you talk, you're right there together again as though you had spoken an hour before. And it's the same kind of thing. You don't have to write every day to make use of it. And you can start very simply. You can say, 
you know, I'm not feeling great today, but I need to lift myself up. You take your journal and you look around and the smallest thing, can, the smallest thing, um, it could be a bird you saw flying across the yard or a flower that suddenly surprised you. And you write about it and you're suddenly in a different place. I love what you're talking about. We'll have to go to another commercial right now. We'll be back. We're live. We're still at 866-451-1451. This is Alice Aspen March and her guest, Dr. Rita Jacobs. We'll be right back. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation Tune into It's All About You with host Dr. Martha Latz, a lively weekly broadcast on BBM Global Network, one of the most empowering shows for time-starved, overscheduled multitaskers. The professional expertise of Dr. Latz is directly available live every Thursday at 1 p.m. to answer and address concerns about relationships, life transitions of career, meeting, dating, and committed relationships. It's All About You with Dr. Latz will expand your understanding of current and concerns across your relationships by broadening and expanding possible solutions in developing skills for mutually desired outcomes. Dr. Martha's expertise is as a licensed marriage and family therapist, life, transition coach, and all things to do with communication at work, home, and with friends. Check out her website at auniquetherapycenter.com. We are back. We are alive, and I want to I want to share something with Dr. Rita about being included, because I know somebody who's who has a journal and she writes about in, inclusion, about how it was so hard for her to be included, and then finally she knows how to get herself included, and that means that she's no longer invisible, and she wrote me a note after I gave a workshop and said, Alice. Thanks to you, I will never be invisible again. Well, but it was through her journal. I mean, and the journal, the journal taught her how to do that. Yes, yes. She didn't have to depend well, on anybody I know, else. I have, some, I have some suggestions for your audience about questions that they can ask themselves in a journal that might um, motivate them. One, one of my favorite ones, is how old do I feel today and why? That's now, great. you know as well as I do that some days you feel like you're six and some days you feel like you're 105. <laughs> and that's I, I, a take, that's a jumping off place, right? Yes. Yes. Um, and here's another one. Who do I think others see when they look at me? That's a great it's question. An question. Yeah, it really is. Who do I think others see when they look at me? I'm writing right. this down. Oh boy! It's a what? really good question. What if we but didn't you can start what? with the basic? With how am I feeling right now? And you just stay in the present and write that. Everyone can answer that question if they spend five minutes writing wouldn't these have been wonderful 
questions for our mothers to have asked us or our fathers, uh, a sort of a generation out of these questions. So we would have learned more about who we were. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's all about learning who you are, and you continue to learn that. Boy, did I, I mean, get... Here's my question. What am I willing to change about myself? Oh, boy. Thank you. <laughs> a great question for people who are stuck. Yep. I'm going to confess something. Okay. I... I think that I, I I could be the grand procrastinator of the Western world. And I think that I got the message that if I ever completed anything that I had a great deal of passion about, I would get in trouble. Because when I was about maybe five, my mother and father and I went on a vacation to Ontario, Canada. And my parents were playing ping pong right next to a picnic table. And my father's camera, his brownie camera, was on that picnic table. And I'd seen him take pictures. So he had this big smile on his face and his hand was back with the ping pong table, with the ping pong paddle. I took the picture. I took the picture. I knew I took the picture. So the pictures come... And they're looking through them. My mom and dad are looking through them. And my mother says, Jerry, look at this one. Who took this one? And I knew which picture it was. So I said, I did. And in unison, they said, each one of them together, you don't know how to take pictures. You can't take pictures. But I knew I'd taken well, pictures. They, it's interesting how people will deny it what's right in front of their eyes. It happens in our country these days. It happens all the time. Because what they were doing is they were coming from a belief system that didn't allow you to have been able to do that. That's correct. What would have happened if they said to me, Alice, look at the talent that you're showing us. What a gift you have. You know, I think when you're old enough, I'll buy you a camera and we'll go out and take pictures together. Rita, my life would have changed. That's what attention is. Accept, I, I, mm, I think there are very few parents who have the wherewithal to respond that way. I hope more well, I, and more do. But I'm working on it. I am working on it. Yeah. And my work, I go back and I ask people for a, an anecdote where they knew they were getting the kind of bad attention and how did it feel? And let's reframe that. And, you know, I want them to, right. to, to go into every emotion, every, everything that they felt at that time and where were they and what was going on because that's part of the whole uh, gestalt. And, you know, that moment changes that moment absolutely changes. You know what? I can I can give you a journal writing exercise that might make people might enable people to gain that kind of attention now that they couldn't gain when they were younger. Go. And that is to make a list of the ten things you would like to hear someone else say to you. Oh boy, what a gift. Just thinking about it makes me happy. Right. So if you can do that, then you know what you can seek. Right? Absolutely. So you can seek that kind of affirmation from other people. Just just putting it out there. It's just what you were saying early on about people being able to stand up for themselves, say what they want. There are lots and lots of ways, and it's hard to figure out what you want. That's one of life's great struggle well but it's certainly think it, of it yeah. in more creative ways like what would I like to hear someone say to me right yes well I always end a, a workshop that I give with go home and ask all the people in your life that you're comfortable with what kind of attention would you like from me 
And if they don't know at that minute, give them inner permission to think about it before they tell you. And when they're ready to come and tell you so that you can work on it or you can't work on it, honestly. So when I was at this conference, yeah, when I was at this conference in California uh, two years ago, I think, two women came up to me separately. And they said, Alice, do not stop doing your work. My husband came up to me and said, am I giving you the right kind of attention? I'm impressed that she got her husband to go to the workshop. Well, this was not, <laughs> it wasn't a workshop. It was the Renaissance weekend. So it's very full. Of, uh, it's the highest achieving group of people that I've ever met. Uh, yeah, you're right. Men don't like workshops because, uh, yeah, they go in with a bias. They want me to change. What do, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, not at this place. Oh, no, this is not man, this is not man bashing. I just, I think that saying to your husband, oh, honey, I want you to come to me with, to an, come with me to an attention workshop would not get the uh, well, well, enthusiastic they, response. But you see, it's not an attention workshop. It's the Renaissance weekend. And I'm just no, no, a piece no. of... No, no, no. Now I know. But when you first said that, I thought, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're right. But I've given workshops on attention, and guys have come. And you know what? I, I do a, an experience, and none of them want to do it. And then when they do it, they're the first people who want to uh, share it. They are so excited. Well, you know, it is interesting. I, as you know, I do journal writing workshops all over the world, and um, sometimes I get professional writers who show up. And right. once I was doing a workshop, and there was a man who was a professional writer, and I thought, oh, this is going to be tough, right? He was a television He's actually not going to say his name. He was a very, very famous television writer and producer. And at the end of the workshop, he came up to me and he said, you know, I have gotten into such a rut writing the way I write, writing dialogue for other people, etc., that this is the first time in ages that I've gone inside and written about myself. And it was exciting. It was wonderful. It was not, it was free form. I, I, I wasn't writing to an end. I was an open-ended writing. And that's really what a journal can do for you. How did you feel when he told you that, Rita? Oh, I was ecstatic. Are you kidding? He was well, um, the, the great compliment. Your, 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 your knowledge and wisdom made a difference in his life. Yeah, it did. Yeah. I hope but, so. Uh, well, he told you. Yes, I know. I mean, I hope he kept it up. I don't know. He's... Uh, still producing and writing TV shows and doing very, very well. And um, I hope that enlightened him about some of his own writing and what it could be. You know, we all get into traps because a lot of us write professionally. So if you tell me uh, you want an article and it's 1,500 words and uh, this is what you want me to cover, I can turn it out. I mean, I'll think and I'll process, etc. But... I'm writing to an end. The idea of not writing to a spec, to a word count, to an end, right. is very, very liberating. And that's the experience of writing in your journal. Yes, absolutely. So, so that, it's really... And that's why I suggest that people write by hand and not write on a word processor. Oh, you I can agree. write on a word processor. I agree. Well, we all need gifts today that bring us joy and that bring us a feeling of accomplishment because we can't go out. There's a, there, well, I don't have to go into it all, but we're deprived of a whole part of our lives of interaction with people. Well, I, I, told I, I know you're going to have to, when we come back, I'm going to talk about writing dialogues. Oh, good, good. About using your journal to write a dialogue and have a kind of social interaction. Wonderful. Yeah. 
Oh, okay, there, there's a friend of mine in California whose right hand answers her left hand or her left hand answers her right hand, which is similar because... Well, the, she's ambidextrous. That's very good. Uh, but the, the, the hands don't look equal. But the, the one okay, hand that's not the dominant one, of course, really lets go. Yeah, it's funny. But we have to go to a commercial now, and we can talk about this too. But I, 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 I just, we only have 15 minutes left. We'll be back. Right. Don't go away, people. According to the American Nurses Association, there are approximately three and a half to four million nurses in the United States. So where do all these nurses work? What kind of roles do they have? What kind of education and training help to prepare them for so many different settings? What kind of impact do nurses have on patient outcomes? The World Health Organization has announced that 2020 will be the year of the nurse, honoring the 200th birth anniversary of Florence Nightingale, an international initiative called Nursing now is underway to raise the profile of nursing. The National Academy of Medicine has convened a committee to create the future of nursing 2020 to 2030 that will focus on how the nursing profession can create a culture of health, reduce health disparities, and improve the health and well-being of the U.S. population. Learn more and join Joyce Batchelor on All About Nursing Wednesdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard Time on the BBM Global Network. Mike Zorick, a three-time California state champion in Greco-Roman wrestling at 114 pounds. Mike, blind since birth, was born in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a six-time national placer, including two seconds, two-thirds, and two-fourths. He also won the Veterans Folk Style Wrestling twice at 152 pounds. In all these tournaments, he was the only blind competitor. Nancy Zorick, a creative spirit whose talents have taken her to the stage and into galleries and exhibitions in several states. Her father, a commercial artist who shared his instruments with his daughter and helped her fine-tune her natural abilities, influenced her decision to follow in his footsteps. Ms. Zorick has enjoyed a fruitful career doing what she loves. Listen Saturday mornings at 12 Eastern for The Nancy and Mike Show for heartwarming stories and interesting talk on the B. BBM Global Network. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality? But it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating. Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. Yeah, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416 529 7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well, be aware, be magical. And we're back. And I've got another question for you, Dr. Rita. Have you ever changed a person's relationship with another person after they got involved in in the dialogue that you're going to tell us about in their journal, writing dialogue? Well, I think I should start by explaining what writing dialogue is before we go into success or failure. Um, one, One of the great journal writing techniques which I use myself and which many others use and it was probably championed by Ira Progoff who was one of the earliest uh, psychologists to deal with journal writing um, is about writing in dialogue form which is where you either where you ask a question or make a statement and let someone else, whoever else, either a person you've named or your higher self, respond to you so that you can dialogue with another person you're having a struggle with. And you would really start by writing, you know, me, him, me, her, whatever it is. 
and ask a question or make a statement and then the re other response comes very very quickly and you just keep writing as though you were writing a play in dialogue form eventually you often find out that even though you've named somebody else you're projecting a part of yourself on them so i, I some people do this with a named person. Some people do it with the society. Some people do it with a famous person they don't know but they're angry at, um, somebody in law enforcement, somebody in government. And some people do it with a concept, like dialoguing with love or dialoguing with anger. I did have someone in a workshop once who was having a difficult uh, romantic relationship and she decided to dialogue with this man and she wrote a long dialogue back and forth back and forth with them answering each other and at the end I mean I usually set a time limit so it was a 15 minute writing exercise for her and at the end of this I asked people to not read aloud but review what they've written so she looked at this she read it, and in the middle of it, I could see her. She smacked her forehead, and I said, what's going on? She said, I just realized I wasn't dialoguing with him. I was dialoguing with my mother. All of his answers sounded just like my mother's answers would, and she started to realize that the struggle within her vis-a-vis -vis this man was a kind of struggle with what her mother expected of her. And it was fascinating. She broke up with him. I don't know whether that was because she broke up with her mother or she broke up with the man. But she credited that with making clear what was going on within her. Not necessarily within the relationship, but within her. I thought that, that was really successful. That is very successful. Wonder and and you know when when you learn that you can do it once you can do it twice or three times. Oh, you can use this technique all the time. Sometimes I have people not name a dialogue companion and ask a question of the universe just out there, and the dialogue is often fast and furious, and you realize that you're you could be dialoguing with uh, you know the little miss perfect inside of you or with mr boss man or with uh your higher self who really knows better i mean the fact is we use we we don't use everything we have in terms of knowledge so accessing intuition is an incredibly important thing to do and one of the ways you can do that is through dialoguing You've given us such an easy, painless, doesn't have to cost anything except for the, for the journal way to really heal some parts of us that we wanted to heal for a long time. Not only mind, it's, but body. And, it, and it's very, very effective. And speaking of the cost of a journal, by the way, for years and years, I kept my journal in those little... Um, elementary school notebooks the you know right. with the black and white marble cover yeah. you know I have, and in yes. fact an expensive fancy journal is a detriment to writing because people are afraid of making mistakes and the one thing you have to know in a journal is you can't be afraid of making a mistake there are no mistakes what a concept <laughs> is that amazing <laughs> Yes, that is amazing. And there are no grammar lessons. There's no right and wrong. There's no... Um, it, you're writing it for yourself. It's not, I mean, you may use this in the future. Say you decide you want to write a memoir. And if people go to my website, there are 20 columns that Random House commissioned me to write called From Journal to Memoir. And the website is readaddjacobs.com. And you can... Each, each of the columns has a, an idea and an exercise and a way you might be able to turn a journal observation into a piece of a memoir, if that's what you're interested in. But journals are not memoirs. Memoirs are where, as Will Rogers says, 
um, you leave out the bad and you only write the good you wish you had done. <laughs> a journal is un, unfettered. It's uncensored. It's only for you. So um, go for it. Well, Rita, you've given us a real lift today because we are capable. You've given us a way to be able to heal ourselves even more than we're doing right now during this lockdown. Uh, it's a, it certainly is a mind-body gift, and it has health benefits. There's no doubt about it. So oh, there's I'm no doubt so- about it. And in fact, if you want to, if anybody wants to look at the eight tips for keeping a gratitude journal, yes, if you go to your search bar and write eight tips for keeping a gratitude journal, Rancho La Puerta. It'll come up. Wonderful. Along with a picture of me. Oh, good. Okay, so you well, can I see who's been talking, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. Next time I'll get your, I'll get somebody to put up a picture. I thought I knew how, but evidently I don't. Anyway, ten, eight tips, eight gratitude tips. So that's what I want to leave tips you with. For keeping a gratitude journal. Yeah. Yep. Thank so what you, are you so grateful for today. I'm grateful for having you on my show, and I'm looking out the window, and the sun is shining. So it's a double Beautiful. gratitude, double gratitude. Absolutely. This was wonderful. A winter day, sunshine. Winter sunshine winter is wonderful. Hey, thank you so much for coming. Well, it's been great been a, fun being with you. It's been well, great you've fun given us so much. It was so, yep. The benefits of knowing people from Rancho La Puerta. Thank you. Have a good week and stay safe and well, Rita. Bye for now, everybody. You too. Take good care. You too in Australia and India and Mexico and Canada and all over the world. You've been listening to Attention Matters with your host, Alice Aspen March. Tune in each week as Alice will provide tools, insights, and an innovative perspective on how to consciously give and receive quality attention here on Attention Matters. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.